That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Welcome to the first episode of the Great Old Ones Podcast. I'm Nate, lost in time and space, and with me are my two co-hosts. I'm uh, Cameron, a.k.a. Man from Lang. I uh, host the uh, Whisper in Darkness YouTube channel. And we're here to talk about Arkham Horror the Card Game. So... I guess before we kick off into the first mythos phase here, um, is there anything we want to uh, say say about ourselves personally before we kick the show off? Or well, I uh, I picked up the game uh, shortly after it was released, and uh, I've been playing it ever since, and uh, been producing content uh, on the Whisper in Darkness for two years now. So. Um, Played over 450 games and counting. Um, still loving it. Wow. Yeah, I, so I'm actually kind of totally on the opposite end of the spectrum where I recently picked the game up um, at the beginning of TFA and then have worked my way back since then. So, mm. and I, st I started creating content in October of last year, so it's only been a few months for me. So, um, so it's kind of cool working with you as you're kind of the, I guess, seasoned veteran among the three of us. Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I actually interned at FFG 10 years ago to the date, actually. Um, so I was there for four months from January to April of 2009. And so this was back during the Call of Cthulhu the card game for those old shout out people if, yeah, if they I've, remember that game I've got my uh, I still have my entire set of Call of Cthulhu I've got a, a friend uh, in a city nearby who I play with uh, from time to time still when we uh, when we get the chance to break out the decks he was a, a stalwart uh, Star Wars CCG player and uh, I uh, demoed call of cthulhu for him uh one afternoon and he went out and started buying all the sets and i think he's only missing like one pack at this point wow that is, i actually uh, you know it's funny i actually don't re really remember playing much of it when i interned there because i played a lot of the kingdom hearts card game that was released during that time um and that was actually a lot of the big reason why i worked there um was i was the the only national champion for the card game and then kind of basically just bugged the shit out of the marketing team until they gave me an internship well sometimes that's what you've you've got to do you've got to uh you got to pester, pester people to get your yeah. uh, foot in the door squeaky wheel right yeah yeah so so that's my history of this nerd them so um looks like we're apparently now missing somebody so uh, I guess we'll just jump right into the mythos phase here and start talking about Return to Dunwich. Um, so what did you what did you think about Return to Dunwich? Did you like it? What did you like? What did you not like? Well, to be to be perfectly honest, I haven't had a chance to play it yet because uh, I've just been too busy with uh, with all the other stuff. The uh, I have looked through some of the cards as uh, I've had to scan them into my system and. Uh, I do like the look of it. I'm a big fan of the uh, of the return to uh, idea. I uh, used to play that, or I still do play the uh, Lord of the Rings LCG, and uh, was a big fan of the uh, the Nightmare Mythos packs, uh, or not Mythos packs, but uh, scenario packs in that uh, in that game. And so, I like when the the designers revisit the old scenarios and and tinker with them a little bit and. Uh, and uh, make them a little tougher for for people who have uh, played them uh, a lot, as I have. Uh, I know uh, the uh, the Dunwich Legacy campaign is still one of my uh, one of my favorites, probably because I can play it pretty quickly at this point. Yeah. And so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to sitting down and uh, making my way through it again. My my only beef with the uh, with the Return to series is that. Uh, Especially when you're playing solo, your your experience with it can be really uh, 
really varies just because it depends so much on which cards you see and, and which cards you don't. I know uh, when I played uh, Return to the Gathering 4 player, I mean, you pretty much, you're going to see every new card that's yeah. in the deck. Whereas if you're playing solo, there's a chance you can uh, you can get through it without uh, seeing any of the new cards. Although I do like uh, I do like what they did with the the first return to uh, box. You know they they made you know the gathering is still pretty straightforward, but uh, yeah, that I mean, they first... basically you know gave that scenario like a complete revamping and made it a real scenario. And yeah, I all think those locations and other things. Yeah. If you're experienced, I mean, you can beat that scenario. <clears throat> excuse me, you can beat that scenario before Agenda Two A, before Agenda Three A. Sorry. So if you, if you can get, if you, if you're fast enough, you can beat it before that Agenda Three A becomes an issue. And and now with the the Return to uh, package, it's it's a lot harder to do that. And so yeah. you actually have to to worry about Agenda Three A a little more. And I expect that when I do. Uh, get down to play return to the, to the dunwich legacy that uh some of those later agendas that uh that i don't see as much was are going to was that just me uh, or did you guys more get of an issue of like i know too. uh for example like uh i think it's uh miskatonic university like i think i rarely ever make it to agenda 3a on that one and uh and uh, blood on the altar same thing you know it's if I'm not done by agenda midway through agenda to two way, something has gone yeah. wrong, seriously gone wrong. So I expect when I sit down to play those that the, the, uh, the doom counts gonna, gonna rise and I'm going to, yeah, the that games was are going to be a little longer. That was definitely one thing I noticed playing through it. The couple of times that I did play through it solo was that the, could the overall, um, I guess consistency of the doom was higher um, I feel like a lot of the time in Dunwich, like you were saying, there are definitely scenarios in that campaign where you can kind of pretty quickly run through them once you get the hang of it. Um, but then the opposite happens when you're playing something like Essex County Express and you can just, you know, straight up die in the first couple of turns. So I like that overall the campaign attempts to kind of smooth things out, but I still... I just wish they would do more with the return two sets rather than just kind of injecting new encounter cards into the sets, but that's just me, I guess. I wish they would do more with the player cards or something, I guess. Yeah, I know I, I didn't do a review for the uh, the player cards from the, the first return two box on my channel. I think largely just because I was I was kind of disappointed in them, to be honest. The like I know the the revamped talents are, you know, they're nice, but I don't think they're essential, and they're not really game breaking in any any way. Like they don't really no like turn players in new directions or really spawn new decks. You know, they're there if you happen to have two experience points to spend. Um, I looked through the uh, the player cards and in Dunwich Legacy and you know I saw the Clarity of Mind in there is in there and I've never played Clarity of Mind at level zero and I just don't see myself playing it at at level two or three or whatever it's at. It's level three, yeah. 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 It's not just, too great. I just sure. don't see myself buying it. You know, it you know it's nice thing, that it's Yeah, it'd be one thing if Carolyn could trigger her reaction with it twice, but you can only trigger it once, I believe, right? Right, that's right. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, it's yeah. I yeah. I think the uh, return two sets. The biggest miss for most of them is in the player cards. They definitely could have done a bit more with that, or just, or just pick more interesting cards. I guess. Yeah. I feel like I feel like every time they do these sets, they kind of pick boring cards in general. Well, I think they might be the cards that are easiest to to sort of tinker with you know to make them tweak maybe to make them a little bit stronger you know i know it like i saw that there was another strange solution in there and i think everybody knows there's really only one strange solution that anybody <laughs> plays and yeah, there's unless, only one acidic kicker you know unless that strange solution is going to be as good or better than that one 
players aren't going to look at it. And so I don't know what it does, but. Yeah. Yeah. It it doesn't make sense to throw in another, another version of strange solution. And um, I think they're just trying to inject life into some of the less used cards Strange Solution was the exception. I think that's that was a weird one. That was a weird choice for them for sure. Yeah, I do. I do like the level two contraband. I think that's pretty neat. I still think it's a little over costed for what it does, but I like it. And I do like the new Rise to the Occasion. That card is also very good. Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at the list here, and I think the ones that stood out to me was Vandalier looked pretty good. Yep. I can't honestly figure out why they made level two blackjack. I mean, level one, <laughs> black, level zero blackjack is useless. Uh, preposterous sketches two is probably okay. Uh, I'm not sure what it. It's a, I think it's, it's Joe free. Diamond. Yeah, it's the is Joe it Diamond free? version. Yeah. yeah. Contraband. I mean, the level zero version is ridiculously expensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, think on your feet. I've played a little bit. I can't honestly remember what the the level two version does. The but... level two version, so I'll, I'll read it off real quick for uh, listeners of the podcast. It is a zero cost, uh, two experience asset with one intellect and two uh, two agility skill icons, bearing the trick trait, and it reads fast. Uh, play when an enemy enters your location. Immediately move to a location, and in parentheses, the enemy still enters your previous location. So, yeah, like. I, I feel like a lot of the time when you use Think on Your Feet, you're kind of, it's kind of has the dodge symptom, I guess. A lot of people use dodge when they don't really need to use dodge. They kind of just use it because they have it. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Like yeah. you, you just take an attack of opportunity just because you have dodge. I see what you mean. Yeah. Y- it's, yeah. It's never in, a, in an instance where it's a, it's a lifesaver. It's actually going to gonna really help you in the scenario it's kind of just right like, well i might as well use this yeah like I, I can't really think of a situation where i'd play think on my feet first or think on your feet versus something like elusive or even um even something like stunning blow or something like that yeah i'm I trying to remember to. the deck that i played think on your feet in and it actually worked okay i think it was during curtain call uh i liked it to get away from from some of those enemies that would spawn as long as the clues were uh, you know as long as i picked up all the clues and i was able to think on your feet out of that location when one of those when one of those many enemies would spawn it was like a free a free action to get myself you know to speed things up a little bit yeah but i, I guess, think yeah. i tend to cut it more often than not yeah, and do you really see yourself spending four experience to include two copies of this in your deck? <laughs> no, I, th- I think I think that's think on your feet is one of those cards you're probably replacing with with other more powerful cards. You're not necessarily yeah. thinking on replacing think on your feet. Yeah. I mean, I see there's right of seeking as well, but that's more of a bridge uh, between the well the um, level the free version and the the higher four. level. I think the level two, the level two right of seeking is useful for those multiplayer games where you don't need to be picking up. I think the level four gets you three clues, right? When you succeed. Yeah, it's it's quite two additional clues. It's really really strong, but there's a lot of times like you won't need that in a in a solo game or in a two player game. Um, The right of seeking level two would be good for something like that, but yeah. or as a step up, like you were saying, Nate, um, you know, if you want to incrementally upgrade eventually to the level four version. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and going on the like, what, like, I just don't understand some of the, like, why, why is there oops? Like, wh- what? Yeah, like, I, what? <laughs> I only played oops in one deck, and that was a combo Wendy deck. And that was just for the two, uh, the two combat skill icons it was never to play oops yeah it's just so, some it's just some strange choices yeah i opinion. hear us all talking about these these cards in this uh the player cards in this return set and it seems like all of them are very like special cases they have uses in specific decks or specific builds but none of them have a universal appeal and other than maybe rise to occasion 
Uh, yeah, because yeah. I mean that card's pretty insane. Yeah. But, um. Yeah. Like I've, I'm rec- I've been recently playing through TFA with a couple of friends of mine, and I'm playing Leo Anderson, and I'm like trying to make Contraband level two work, but ah, God, it's so hard. Like my plan is to just buy lightning guns and contraband and just <laughs> lightning gun the shit out of some some snake monsters. So hopefully it goes out well, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, I one thing that I do like too is they added a weakness, but yeah, I just wish they would do more. Yeah, I like I cards. like the fact they added the weakness as well. I mean, it's the weakness pool is up to twenty six, I think, at this point. If you own everything. So you're not gonna. It's nice to have a lot of, of variation in the, you know, yeah. a lot of different I totally agree with weakness. you. I'm a big fan of weaknesses. I think they add a lot of depth to the to the game and to the character. You know, it's uh, it's definitely a good thing when you have a lot a big pool of weaknesses. Yep. But um, so um, Cameron hasn't played through any of the scenarios so he wasn't really able to oh. share his thoughts but what do, what do you think about the scenarios as a whole i think as a whole the return to doesn't make a tremendous impact in a lot of them um i did mix i, I did a lot of playthroughs where i mixed the two there's an option where you can take half and half of the cards from the original set that are and then the ones that are supposed to replace them and just put half in and that that added a, a really nice dynamic um but overall i don't think the changes are overly drastic. Uh, there's a couple of scenarios where it does make a tremendous difference. Um, where Doom awaits being a big one. That was a, a major pain in a lot of people's backs with that bug in the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, for those who, who don't know, there's a, there's a location in where Doom awaits in the original Dunwich Legacy where if you don't have a high investigate value or don't have a way to investigate at a high number, you're pretty much stuck and you can lose the entire game right there. Um, so they fix that. So that a lot of investigators that don't have high intellect or use cards to gain clues uh, for free without taking a test can actually still move the, the act forward. So that was a nice change. Um, the, the ones that stick out are definitely where Doom awaits. I like that they added a lot of variety to the, to the creatures in, um, What's the what's the one before the name escapes me? Um, uh, undimensioned, undimensioned and unseen. Undimensioned and unseen. So now there's a lot of variety in the abilities and and the strengths of the creatures. So that's that's definitely interesting and adds a li- a little bit more to that scenario. I found that scenario very boring uh, the first time around. This kind of adds a little variety, so that was nice. Um, the one that's there, that's really out there is um, the final scenario. It's just in pure insanity, I've, I haven't been able to win it yet. Uh, Lost in time and space, it's... It's brutal, man. It's brutal. That one is... The changes that they made to it are just absolute insanity. It's yeah. good. I, I love it. <laughs> like, nine, nine. Why? Why? <laughs> right? <laughs> Why? Yeah, yeah. It's just... It's so crazy, it just makes you crack up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like it's like reading the back of... Uh, what is that? Agenda or... Um... Yeah, Agenda 2B on um, Curtain Call. It's yeah. like taking 100 horror. <laughs> They're like, what? The, no. Pretty much, yeah. Um, so what do we... Do we think the, the return two sets overall are are something that was necessary for the game? I think they're, I think they're necessary. Um, I mean, obviously people don't have to buy them if they don't want to. And, and uh, I mean, we've already talked about the player cards being... Mm-hmm fairly specialized so i don't think you're really missing out if you don't happen to have uh clarity clarity of mind level three your your or oops level two it's not gonna break your game uh for players like myself who play a lot and sort of play scenarios repeatedly uh, i like having them just to to mix things things up a little bit I'd sort of like to see the the return to series sort of smooth out some of the the issues with the the scenarios. Like I, I really do like the the Dunwich Legacy campaign, except for Undimensioned and Unseen, because it is so uh, 
punishing on low willpower investigators. And basically these days I just skip it. Like I'll just, I'll, and it, I'll just go in to, to blood on the altar, bomb it, take my, you know, take the freebie because then I only get like one or two, I think two of the horrors and then I'll just resign automatically on undimensioned <laughs> and then I'll just take the two, the two doom yeah. for where doom awaits because it's just not worth my time trying to figure out how I'm going to boost a, a two willpower investigator up to six, seven, eight yeah. nine yeah. willpower for like not one test, but repeatedly like 12. Yeah. You've got to do it three or four times per game. And, and, you know, unless you've really uh, planned for that ahead of time, and you've built your deck in a very specific way, you're just not gonna be able to do that. And so I'd, I'd like to see them deal with issues like that, like that, that things that in hindsight you look at and say, okay, well, we're sort of limiting the types of investigators that can, that can play these scenarios. Like that's what I would, li I would like them to address with, with these sorts of sets. Yeah, I think one thing that kind of makes that difficult is that they're trying to balance a solo and a multiplayer game all at once. So I think, um, not to say that what you're saying is invalid, but it can, it's definitely, you're walking a bit of a tightrope, I guess. Um, you know, because you obviously want to have investigators feel good at what they're doing. Like, you want the investigators with high willpower to be the ones that do cool stuff like that, but... I do agree that they really shouldn't make scenarios entirely contingent on those one or two things. Um, yeah, I played through Return to Dunwich with Joe, so Joe Diamond solo, and yeah, I got to that scenario and I tried. I don't know why. I apparently just <laughs> wanted to enjoy some sadistic pleasure, and yeah, it was brutal. It's like it's impossible. You can't reasonably go through the entire campaign just to you know build your deck to do well in this one scenario that overall really doesn't do much for you in the long scheme of things yeah maybe if they included more ways to uh, you know to change up your deck as the as you progress through a campaign i mean right now all we have really is adaptable and that's rogues and off-class rogues get access to that and everybody else is sort of stuck with yeah with what you start with and i think if they had a little a few more cards that were thematic for you know the particular classes i think that would free up people a little bit more to uh you wouldn't necessarily feel like okay well i'm i'm playing i think the last time i played the dunwich legacy was uh through the dunwich legacy was with preston and yeah, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, taking a one yeah. willpower investigator through that is not is not going to be a success. Yeah, and so I I know there are ways you know the scenarios do align in such a way that you can you can resign but and then try to race where doom awaits. But you know I'd like to be able to play them all. Definitely, Maybe, right. you know I don't think I don't think that you have to to excel at them all. You know, I don't think that's a reasonable expectation, but, you know, to at least have a fighting chance, I think, is, yeah. isn't fighting too much to important. ask. I, yes. I think the what, what you were mentioning, having cards like Adaptable to, to fix it, those would be great for, like, once you're familiar with the scenario. On an initial playthrough, though, I mean, I can't imagine someone new to the game, you know, being excited to get there and then having that scenario just beat them down completely and feel completely hopeless. It's, you know, a, a blind run, I think, is, is just as important because that's the first impression that people get um, when playing a scenario or, or a cycle. It happened with TFA. A lot of people were, were very upset initially. I think people's feelings about uh, the TFA is the Forgotten Age, for those of you who don't know. Um, I think a lot of people are softening their stance on the Forgotten Age and... You know, but it was that initial playthrough that just had a lot of the community up in arms. Yeah, it's it's a hard campaign. It's definitely not for the um, soft of spirit. But yeah, I think this kind of segues into our next topic of um, I put in my show notes professional production. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, are there 
do we think the card pool is big enough now with the circle undone that um, cards can be themed without having to use common staple cards? Well, I think I tried when I did my initial playthrough of the of uh, the Forgotten Age with Ursula. I was quite impressed by the way the seeker cards in that box all sort of lent themselves well to a to sort of a thematic archaeologist build with relics and whatnot and uh, I think it was around the boundary beyond when I realized that this just was not going to work and that I was better <laughs> off playing Dr. Mylan Christopher. Um, I think it's possible. I, I think anything is possible with, with this game and, and people will play it as as they see fit and I know some people want to be able to, to build theme decks and play them. Um, whether you're going to be successful in a cam, like over the course of a full campaign, um, I think that's another question entirely. I know at least with Ursula, I just didn't feel like I had the tools I needed to be competitive as the scenario, as the difficulty of the scenarios became uh, greater. I think we're starting to see some themes uh, or some more variations start to creep up. Uh, I don't think we're we're quite there yet. I think with a few more cycles, the card pool will be large enough where people can have two guardians that are fighting guardians that have completely different decks and different ways that they handle certain things. Um, we're getting there. I, I think this game definitely still has a lot of growth potential and it's headed in the right direction. So I'm, I'm glad to see uh, the cards that, that they released for this cycle are really great pretty much for every class um, but I still think that some certain staples are still necessary for especially like mystics you know are kind of still shoehorned into a certain type we're seeing that change a little bit with Diana decks and a few other like um, you know control type decks chaos bag control and encounter deck controls and even those types of decks aren't quite there yet but they are getting there yeah, I think I think that's more a problem in solo, where you're kind of shoehorned into doing a bit of everything. So you need you just kind of need your cards to do the most amount of impact for for each slot. But um, in multiplayer, I definitely think it's possible that you can build theme decks. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously they're not going to be as powerful as the decks that you play, like Doctor Myland Christopher and Flashlight in. Or, you know, or like Flashlight plus Lola Santiago. But, you know, you can... I think that's what makes this game great is that you can tailor the experience to how you want to play the game. Like, if you want to play with cards that are less mechanically powerful, you can just make the Chaos Bag less potent. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm curious about where they're going to go with the, with the card design and, and whether you'll be able to, to really explore themes because i think what they've they've tended to do it seems lately is a lot of the player cards are tailored to towards specific investigators and i think that i mean you can certainly play the cards in in any uh investigator that you want to but i think when you sit down and look at them some of them obviously work better in certain investigators than others and I can understand why the designers approach it that way because it, it, you know, helps them create cards that are moderately powerful without um, sort of throwing them open to every investigator who can use them. So, you know, Jim gets his his clutch cards and, you know, in this, in uh, The Circle Undone, a lot of those rogue cards, I mean, they have Preston's name written all over them. Yeah. Certainly other rogues can use them, but, you know, those rogues are going to have to to build their deck in a certain way if they want to be able to uh, to use them effectively. And I think going forward, it'll be interesting to see whether they just keep, you know, we're going to get a few cards each cycle that are sort of general use for the, you know, the investigators of that class. And then there are going to be others that are very specific towards you know, we're going to see the, the Rita cards and the Preston cards and the, you know, the Carolyn cards this cycle. So yeah. I'm going to, it's going to be interesting to see where they balance, how they balance that out. 
And there's always going to be people online who find a certain use for a card that nobody thought of before, and it just opens up a whole world of possibilities for for other investigators, and I think that's pretty awesome. Yep. Yeah, um, I think... Um, yeah, I, I think we're, we're getting there, though. I think there are definitely uh, some really cool themes coming out. Like, I recently thought of uh, something that that I see happening, more of a enemy control deck where you're, you're not killing the enemies, you know, with the uh, warning shot coming out. Uh, what what Do you guys remember what set or what uh, expansion? I think uh, that's... Um, I want to mm-hmm. say it's either Wages of Sin or Union and Dissolution. I like, think it's... Union and Dissolution. Yeah, so someone like, um, you know, um, like uh, Roland, who can take Seeker and Guardian cards, can use Handcuffs and Persuasion and Warning Shot and kind of avoid the enemies without actually evading them, without actually, you know, using different types of ways to kind of get rid of enemies without actually killing them. I think those are those are the kind of interesting ideas that i'm thinking of in terms of you know theme decks and such and Mm -hmm. i see these developing and and it's exciting to me i think that it'll be interesting to see what the community comes up with when we have a big enough card pool for these kind of things i think another thing that kind of obviously influences the power or you know the meta power of a card is obviously the encounter decks and how those are structured too so you know, depending on how they design the encounter decks, too, is obviously going to largely change how the card pool interacts with it. So, yeah, I know uh, in in listening to some of the uh, the Lord of the Rings LCG podcasts, I know that some one of the problems that they they I, they've run into in that game is that the the encounter decks have become so ruthless in that particular game that you're pretty much forced into playing the premium cards if you want to have any shot at uh, at beating them and not just premium cards but you know the they have say the five or six you know top decks that can actually compete with those scenarios and then if you take anything you know that's a that's a b or a c you're going to struggle and i hope we don't end up in in that situation in that game because i think that would make for you know we do have uh, the scenarios are linked in a campaign and so playing eight brutally hard scenarios in a row would not be something that i would be interested in doing especially yeah, if you if you built a deck with the best of intentions on scenario before scenario one and then find out uh, by scenario two that you you're just vastly underpowered for for what uh you know what the scenario demands i think that you know i think matt newman has done a pretty good job so far of of keeping the power level fairly um, stable, consistent. I guess. Yeah, yeah, consistent. That's that's the word I'm looking for. You know, the, TFA was a little bit more on the, you know, a little bit more difficult. But, you know, when I play those scenarios, I still do well. And I still, you know, yeah. I still feel like I'm not, I'm not getting blown out of the water. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. Whereas if I play some of those lord of the rings scenarios you can definitely get blown out of the water that that um, is a scary thought for sure i that forgotten age i think scared a lot of people uh into thinking that this is what was happening with this game um at least initially uh i'm glad it didn't turn out that way and i, I don't know I, I hope that I think when the card pool just gets really large, the the developers just feel like certain decks just get really powerful and they just need to up the uh, the difficulty of the game. And I, I agree with you. I hope it doesn't get to that point with this game. But as the card pool grows, I think the developers have no choice but tweak that difficulty to kind of match the or challenge the people that own all the cards. But uh, it's it's a balancing act because... Also, you have new players coming in, and if that's the first cycle that they buy, and it's something extremely difficult, they can get discouraged and never try the game again. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Do you guys think the card pool would ever be too big? Do you think it would be something that that could get to that point where it's just too big and where it becomes a problem for the game? The um, the wide as an ocean, but deep as a puddle comp problem. 
so to speak. Um, I don't really think so. I mean, personally, I think one thing that this game has going for it, in opposed to Lord of the Rings, is that you're, you neuter your own deck by adding weaknesses. So every draw kind of feels um, tenuous, where you're like, ah, oh, shit, if I draw my weakness this turn, this is going to suck, or something along those lines. And I think the way that I don't, like, I'm admittedly, I'm not familiar with the way that the encounter decks are structured in Lord of the Rings, but you could, I feel you could design the encounter decks in Arkham to um, challenge challenge the investigators in different ways. One, one particular thing I've been thinking about is the idea of having double-tested encounter cards. So, for instance, uh, I know you, Cameron, particularly talk about hating the card Entombed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so, think we all hate that card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean that card sucks. But imagine, like, for instance, instead of like, oh, uh, pass an agility test, or you fall into the tomb. Imagine it was like pass an agility test or fall, or so you fail and then you have to pass a strength test to you know grab the ledge or something. Well, we've already seen the the card like that in in Depths of Yoth, Depths of Yoth uh, the Crumbling yeah. Precipice, where that you know it it gives you I can't remember the order it's offhand like agility, chances. yeah, agility, but like you could do uh, more stuff like that, you know. I yeah, think that I was like... that was on the actual, um, yeah, that's on the location itself, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, and I think those you know the the way that the cards are designed lend themselves to that. So you have. Um, you know, cards with multiple skill icons on them. I think you could have um, some of those cards, like um, I sort of envisioned it them doing sort of like, okay, you make a, um, like say an agility and a combat test back to back, but you can commit a card like able-bodied to both of them. Oh, that'd be cool, yeah. Or something like that. So you can use those cards that have multiple skill icons on them for multiple tests. Or you'll have, you know, and that would, I think, sort of lend, lead people to play those cards more. Whereas, yeah. like, someone like myself, I'm, I'm, I think I'm fairly resistant to change when it comes to deck building. So I stick with my manual dexterities and my, my overpowers. So putting in a test like that would sort of force me out of the box and say okay well now able-bodied is is a good card because i it it works against both of these tests rather than having to commit you know cards to the agility and then cards to the combat like you said i think there's a lot of room for growth in this game and you know they're just getting started on exploring exploring yeah. what they can do with it as far as you know the the size of the card pool um you know in lord of the rings they're designing cards, I think, for just four separate classes. And so um, in this, they're, I think they're designing cards mostly for, for separate investigators. So I don't think the card pool is ever going to get to an extent where it's, where it's unwieldy because they can, they can really zero those cards in to certain investigators rather than just sort of throwing it out there for the class as a whole. They're gonna be. There are gonna be cards like that, of course. That, you know, something like stick to the plan that is good in, yeah. you know, if a guardian can take it. Well, go we'll ahead talk about because, one of those cards later, but because it's it's gonna be good. But, you know, some of the other more niche cards that that are only gonna work with certain investigators. Like level two contraband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, gonna make that work. I'm telling you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 I had no idea that Lord of the Rings was just four classes and that was it. I thought they had individual characters. Well, um, they do have, they do have individual heroes, but the, the cards them, themselves aren't really designed. Like there are some that work with certain heroes, but, um, the card pool, uh, tends to be pretty, pretty wide open. Like they, they use traits there to, uh, to sort of narrow things down like um so it'll have like an elf trait or a dwarf trait or something like that to okay. to sort of narrow the card to who can play it and that's how they balance it there oh and well, i think that's... in arkham they'll they'll balance it by simply making it for a 
you know, if they want, if they really want to balance something, they just make it for a, sim- a single investigator. Yeah, yeah. And then you know the card won't won't be played, except that's, by that guy. Or that's girl. really good to hear because when you were talking about the problem with Lord of the Rings, that was uh, a little disheartening to see the future of Arkham go in that direction. But now that you mention the way their deck building works as opposed to the to the Arkham. You also have a sixty card deck in that game too, I believe, right? Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I think I just uh, I think the different one of the key differences between the uh, the the encounter decks in the games is is having played a lot of Lord of the Rings, you can get situations where the deck will simply combo off on turn one and and crush you. And I think of all the games I've played, I've only had one in uh, in Arkham where that has it's come close to doing that. So I feel like the I don't know whether it's just because you have more options um, in terms of what you can do with your investigators, like you can fight, you can evade, you can investigate. Uh, that just makes it a little easier to get out of those situations. But uh, like that, that encourages me that I, I know I've there have been many games where I've set it up and it's taken me longer to set it up than it has been to play it. Yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't happen that often in the in Arkham. In my experience, anyway. definitely, yeah. Yeah. mostly in my experience too. Unless I apparently just draw two auto fails in a row in Essex County Express, but other than that, <laughs> other than that. But um, speaking of expanding the card pool, uh, the Circle Undone was released at the end of January. Um, what do you guys think about that set? I know, obviously, you guys have had plenty of chance to play it now. So, I think the Circle Undone is a very very good direction for the game so far what i've seen both story-wise the theme the player cards and just the way each scenario is set up the complexities of it it everything is perfect for me or at least near perfect let's just say near perfect yes near perfect <laughs> um yeah sorry sorry go go ahead cameron yeah, I I haven't again. I've been waiting to do the blind playthrough for my for my channel, and so I haven't played the I've played the uh, the prologue, of course. But uh, as far as the player cards go, I do. Uh, there are quite a few quite a few good ones in there. Um, there are a few that I'm kind of I'm not sure I'll play. <laughs> yeah, but, I, have, uh, I have similar feelings. The uh, like the 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 whole skill set uh, that they released. I think those those sorts of I, I understand why they why they design them that way, but I think you it's it can be really hit or miss where um, you can end up with a, a set of cards like like the uh, composures from Echoes of the Past where they just don't see a lot of play and uh, yeah for whatever reason and I think they actually did better in this case because some of them are I think stronger than others. I don't think all of them are going to see an equal amount of play, but there are some standouts. Um, yeah, generally, like I really like the cards. The uh, I'm a little I have mixed feelings about the prologue. I, part of me, you know, I can understand why they do it, and it's you know really what they they needed to make it work was just the four investigators. Really, that's all that they had to add to uh, to do that. But uh, having played it now. I don't know a half dozen, more than a half dozen times. I'm pretty much done with it, <laughs> and I don't think I'll be playing it, uh, even if you know. I'll just pick a I don't know clue number out of a bag or something like that and say <laughs> this is how many. Like I, I I played a game again tonight just to see, and and it just feels very. I don't know. I I don't like to use the word random, but it just feels like. If it works, it works, and you'll get a bunch of clues. And if you draw a couple bad, if you get a couple bad pulls, you're dead and move on. You know, yeah, swingy. It, it just feels as swingy as hell. And <laughs> yeah, I feel and, the same way. And it doesn't really like. I love scenarios like like the Unspeakable Oath. You know, like I played that thing to death, like just over and over again because I loved how that scenario worked. And and then you you know you play something like the prologue where it's just like okay well if i fail this skill test i'm done yep and i could play it again of course but it's still going to be the same 
the same sort of thing is going to happen. You know, I'm either going to get the clues this turn or I'm not, and then, you know, move on. So I, I guess I, you know, I like the fact that they created these investigators specifically for it, but that's four player cards that we didn't get. Yeah. And maybe I'd point. prefer maybe I'd prefer to have those. Instead. I'd almost just prefer to have them as investigators. Honestly, I mean, <laughs> Jerome is sick. Like, if you could use Jerome in a real deck, oh, man, uh, he'd be he'd be insane. Uh, um, I, I mean, I guess so. I, I think the... Um, I, I see it from a different perspective. I like the prologue, the whole prologue as a storytelling tool. It just sets up the rest of your campaign. I don't know. I, I, I do uh, enjoy the outcome because each time it's going to be slightly different or you know what ends up happening to them and i can just envision what you know what happened before you actually start playing the game i get what you're saying cameron with you know having to replay it over and over but generally when we play like how many times do you play um i was going to say the gathering but let's say the how many times in the last month have you played the path to carcosa as a campaign as a full campaign i haven't yeah. Yeah, so right now we're immersed in it because the cycle just came out. But I think you might warm to it a little bit, you know, because you might play the circle and done after we've gotten our playthroughs in, um, maybe once in a while. And I think maybe you'll enjoy it. Maybe you'll enjoy it. Yeah, you know, when it's no, I, I agree with you. I think it's a great storytelling tool. And that's one of the strengths of this game. And, and, um, and, uh, so I, you know, kudos to the to Matt Newman for for creating, you know, this for using this this storytelling tool to really immerse uh, immerse players in uh, the story right away. For me, is I, you know, I tend to to approach the game not so much from a story aspect, but from just a being able to play it, mm, you know, to to play a scenario and really enjoy that scenario. And the scenarios that I can play over and over again are the ones that I like the most, that I get the most out of. Yeah. And so when I run into something like the prologues, it's just like, yeah, it's cute, and <laughs> you know, it's you know, it's nice. It's a nice thing to do once or twice, but after that, it's sort of like, well, there's other things I'd rather play. And you know, who knows? I mean, they've Matt. Matt is like surprised us continuously over the past uh, since the the game came out and I sort of uh, when they uh, released the announcement for these investigators I thought you know oh well maybe they'll come back yeah. at some point you know maybe you'll get to pull them out again oh, and cool. play another prologue at some point you know maybe if, if they get lost in the mists you get a chance to get them out or or something like that like it, anything's possible and, well, that would be mind blowing. Oh, and man. and if they did something like that, then I'd be like, okay, I'm you know on board because if the if how they die matters during the prologue matters, like when you get to bring them back and play uh, them again, then that would be for me. That would be I that guess, would change your mind. mind. That would change my mind. That would yeah. be more interesting to me than simply you know I know I'm gonna die. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of halfway. I'm, I, I agree with you that the the prologue is boring. Not, not boring, but it feels, you you know what you're getting yourself into going into it, and it's like you said, uh, if you fail that one important skill test through in that scenario, you just you're completely screwed and. There's no way of coming back, like, in a normal scenario. And that's frustrating to play from a gameplay perspective. I feel like um, the story aspect of this scenario, while it's very good, more feels like a one-shot for an RPG than it does, a, you know, a game of, Call of Cth or a game of Arkham Horror. Hmm. Maybe that's just me and my hmm. playing of a lot of RPG games, but Matt Newman really really should be writing an rpg because this is what this scenario <laughs> feels like to me it definitely has that feel um i i can see where you guys are coming from if you're playing the game to 
for the for the game aspect, um, not so much the story aspect. You want to get your you want to be able to use your deck that you built. This scenario kind of takes away from that amount from that time that you have to actually play the deck that you wanted to play. So I can see that. I can certainly see that. Well, it's um, not really so much. I guess it's not so much that they build the deck for you. It's more that the the games are so swingy. Like you just right. you, you're so reliant on that. Like really, it's one investigate check. I think. Right. I meant. Uh, I, I know. I know what you mean. I, I meant like, oh, you just want to get to your to your actual the real game as opposed uh, to this fake. I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can see that. Uh, one thing with those uh, intro investigators, I felt like they really showcased like the the abilities and the the strengths of each class, except for Mystic. Um, it was interesting to see a perfect kind of perfect starting hand for each class, and you know, a board state that was that was uh, really useful for that type of class, like the rogue and the um, yeah you know, the survivors and the seekers, like it. It was interesting. I think for new players, it, it could be really useful to show them how to properly deck build, how cards work together, how certain combos work in terms, you know, mm. specifically. With That's the what that is one of the things that really impressed me about the prologue is that the cards that you're playing with, you get, you know, most there's a lot of the new cards in there, so you get to see how they work. And I, from a new player perspective, someone who's never played a rogue before. And if they pick up Valentino and they've got, you know, a, a very set amount of cards and, you know, a lot of those cards are quite powerful in that particular deck and you get to see how they work. And then it's it's sort of just a, a nice little dry run through um, for what's ahead. And then when you go, you know, maybe they can look when they go to sit down and say build a Preston deck, they say, OK, well, Preston is like Valentino, so I want to include cards like cunning and uh, money talks and stuff like that so it, it gives them a direction to go into rather than simply dumping a bunch of uh, cards in their lap and saying okay here's a new investigator and some cards try to build something out of this and it, yeah. it does point them in the direction and say okay well connected works if you've got a lot of resources and money talks and cunning also works so here's a guy who generates a lot of resources yeah, right. you've already <laughs> played this deck you've already played this style of deck once so now you've got a now you've got an idea of where to go and i also like the the prologue just because it does a good job of also introducing the haunted ability yeah which as i mentioned before we started recording is just going to be a thorn in my side but it is a nice introduction to that before you actually play the main scenarios so you're already familiar with what it does and and how to trigger it and things to pay attention to and i and i do like that about it yeah, would so would you guys? Uh, so say if you were gonna teach a new player, would you bust this scenario out, or would you play the gathering and just build them a starter deck? No, I do the gathering. Um, I think this is a good second step for someone who's learning, um, but I don't think it's a, it's good enough for showcasing the game step by step, like the gathering is. Yeah, I I think, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um... I think I'd, I'd probably just stick with the gathering because the gathering you can have success <laughs> and in <laughs> the disappearance you there is no success you That's are going to you are going to lose yeah and it's just a matter of how you're going to lose and and maybe if you explain to the player going in that this is more to showcase the player cards and how they interact and and teach them some of those um, some of the interactions with the cards I think it could be really useful in that way instead of sort of throwing them into the deep end and saying, okay, here's 40 cards. You know, it, 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 it really narrows their options to the seven in their hand. And it's very quick to play. I, yeah. I don't know what it's like in multiplayer, but for me, it rarely takes, you know, longer than five turns. So you could play it a couple times and, and they could experiment with, with the four different neutral investigators and get a sense, okay, I sort of like how the you know the survivor cards work i think that's really cool i want to play a survivor okay well if you want to play a survivor then we've got rita or we've got you know if you have a larger card pool then you can pull out any of the other survivors and you've you've sort of introduced them to the mecha the, the main mechanics and then they have a sense okay i want to play a seeker i love 
I love Jerome's interactions. I'm going to play a Seeker. Okay, well, there's Joe Diamond or, you know, any of these other ones you can play with. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking it's a good second because they're it, it's great at introducing the different classes and their differences, their play styles and so on. But someone brand new to the game, there's a lot to take in and the gathering just kind of trickles it little by little. You know, you start in one room and you're just investigating and then the mythos phase happens and then you're then you're learning to deal with treacheries and it kind of just does it little by little. This one just throws you into an actual full scenario. I don't know. I, I think I think you bring up some good points. It's it's really great for new players to see the differences between the the different factions. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would yeah, be tough a for point. a new player to, to to play disappearance and be like, okay, you failed an investigate check, so now a lot of bad stuff is gonna happen <laughs> to you. Yeah. Whereas if you if you blow that first investigate check in the study, nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's it's like I know in this one, I forget which one. Oh yeah, like when I played Jerome, it was like, okay, I just drew obscuring fog on my first turn, so now I'm at a six shroud location. This isn't gonna go well. And resign. <laughs> you know, whereas you know the 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 gathering gives you a lot more time to sort of play around and investigate, and you don't have, you know, five or six monsters chasing you down. Like there's so many hunters in this set. I'm, I'm dreading seeing what that's like in a real game where you've got all these um, shadow hounds and and wraiths chasing you around the board. I didn't. <laughs> so, at least in my play experiences, I didn't have so much problems with the shadow hounds and the nether mists. It was the witches at the end of the first scenario that you played oh. through. Uh, sorry, spoiler alert, but. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. Cameron, have uh, you played that that first one yet? After the no. prologue, okay, you are no. in for a hell of a ride. <laughs> I was I was very tempted to play it uh, to play it tonight before uh, we recorded, but uh, I know there are people who listen to my channel who like the blind playthroughs, and I would hate to. I, yes. I should I should. Sorry if it, that spoils it for your viewers. No, uh, no, no. I I I I should have had it done by now, but but uh, unfortunately, some real life things have uh, have tied me uh, got me busy the other thing is i just haven't chosen a deck yet uh, people have asked me to to play diana and uh, so i've been doing some deck testing with her just to familiarize myself with her deck and and play around with a few different uh, builds and i'm still trying to find one that i like and i think she she runs into the same problem that that a lot of mystics have which is resources and and being slow yeah and i start. think i think diana is further compounded in that she has to like play that whole mini game just to get her willpower to a level that any other mystic investigator would already be at yeah i know when they spoiled her i saw that and i'm just like man that one i know she's gonna be i know she's a six like i know you can get her to a six but She's going to be a one for a long time, yeah. and shriveling it too is not not that viable. <laughs> you just can't do it, and and that's sort of what I've discovered in my in the, the, the preliminary testing I've done. It's 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 just like she gets there eventually, but there's sort of a lot of hand wringing before you can get her to that point where. Yeah, and it's like if you wanted to, if. Uh, like Di- like Diana has to be played in this very specific way that you can't you can't really like build your way out of it I guess like you can with other other mystics like I would say like Akachi and Agnes are probably the most versatile of the of the mystics is that fair to say Yeah I I I've, I've had Agnes pull herself out of there was one game I played with her where I thought you know she was surely cooked and she pulled herself out of it, and I don't, uh, I don't think you could do that with many other investigators. I think for um, I think for Diana, um, I, I was researching a lot of decks for her. I haven't really had a chance to play her too much, um, but I had great success with a deck that I found on Arkham DB, and her play style is definitely a lot different from from the typical Mystic. With Diana, at first I was tempted to cancel as many things as I could just to try to get that willpower. 
Um, I found myself making a lot of play mistakes and eagerly trying to use a card on something I didn't need to use it on just to try and get it under her to boost that willpower. Mm. And it makes you, it kind of playing that way forces you to make bad plays that you normally wouldn't make. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think it's yeah, awfully tempting to, to try to, you've got that, I mean, you start with that cancel in your hand and mm -hmm. it's just like, well, two willpower is better than one, <laughs> so I better cancel something as quickly as I can. And so you end up wasting it on something that, that you should probably have just taken to the face and, and moved on. Yeah, for sure. So in this deck, this uh, I think Doc Leo is the name of the guy who made the deck, and he kind of goes into detail on how to how to play how to pilot that deck. And I tried it out, and it was it was awesome. It was using a lot of guardian cards to fight with, and he recommended just using the cancels when you needed them, and your willpower would grow just organically throughout the scenario. So don't count on willpower for pretty much anything. And in the end, by the end of the scenario, you're going to be super powerful with your willpower, and then you can unleash on the boss or whatever for the finale. But not to count on that willpower getting to six quickly because it's just going to really mess up the beginning, and then you'll lose you'll lose tempo and you'll never catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. That's a good point. Because because if you spend your time canceling everything, then you're not investigating and you're not fighting enemies. So. Yeah, I think I think that's the the problem a lot of new players run into is that that you know sometimes just investigating is the better the better thing to do. Yep. If you get too, I think there's a it's very tempting to try to to do a lot of fancy stuff and and really it's just you know just investigate. Yep. Even Move, if you know the, yeah if the odds if the odds aren't that great well. You know, you're st you still might get a clue, and that's that's probably better than what you were you were gonna do. Yeah. Are you talking about the Doc Leo deck? The Doc Leo, yeah, that one. The Contrite Sorceress deck. Yeah. On Arkham BB. That one's really good. Yeah, I played that one against uh, Curtain Call and uh, didn't quite make it. Oh so, no. <laughs> no, it was yeah, it was a. But but that scenario is is tricky to to navigate because you've, I mean you've got to kill that, the bloody that the bloody emissary. Guy. Mm -hmm. You got to kill the emissary like two or three times, uh, to be able to complete that scenario. And I just couldn't get her high enough to do that consistently. That scenario is hard in solo in general. So yeah, it yeah. is. It took it me is. took me like a dozen playthroughs before I could beat that thing with any sort of consistency. So yeah, I think also most of the it's not just the scenario, but just Dan is deck building, but also the a lot of the investigators from the cycle from the circle undone. I think for me that was it's not a, a miss. It's actually a great thing because these investigators all have these unique abilities and deck building requirements. But a lot of them are more complex than some of the investigators that came before them. So I think their deck building is taking more time and more trial and error to figure out than previous investigators. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. These are yeah. definitely the most complex investigators that they've released thus far. Yeah, Joe Joe Diamond is pretty... I've, I had a chance to play him uh, a fair amount recently, and he was... Uh, yeah, I I don't think I could play him on stream because I would always forget to to draw his hunch card. Like I don't know how many times <laughs> I forgot to do it when I was just playing playing yeah. for funsies. But man, it was just like, oh yeah, I should have drawn a card for that. Oh right. yeah. Oh, you, you leave it flipped. To... Yeah, you yeah. leave it flipped over, and then you're like, oh crap, I should have put another one on. And then, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's it's just one of those. It's just that one extra step that you've got to do every turn that. Yep. Uh, I did uh, have a chance to play one of the other Diana Stanley decks on Arkham DB, the uh, Get Away From Her, You Bitch uh, deck. <laughs> uh, I played Great it at, a, at an invocation event, and uh, it just made me wish that Eat Lead was an asset. <laughs> yep, yep. I, uh, it's, it just it, 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 it killed a few things, but it just couldn't kill things consistently enough to, 
to make me wish that I just wasn't playing a, a pure guardian. Yeah. And I never did see an eat lead until the game was over. So oh. yet to play it one of these days. So what do you guys like most about the new cycle? Uh, at death's doorstep, that scenario is awesome. That's my favorite part about <laughs> this, uh, this whole deluxe expansion, I think. Other than obviously the investigators and the new player cards, but yeah, that scenario is great. I assume from the setup, I haven't played it yet, but the setup, it, you start with the regular locations and then you swap to the spectral locations at some point? Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fun. It's fun. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's cool. You know, you get some, like, noir jazz playing in the background. Yeah, it's it's, it's a good time. Yeah, so far, I mean, I, I, I really like the look of... Uh, I like the fact that we're staying in Arkham and invest we're going to be exploring some of the the iconic arkham locations uh, that we all know and love um, either from the board game or or the stories and uh yep the unvisited isle yeah and it sounds like the the only one that sort of raises my alarm bells was the the last one they spoiled uh chaos Oh, yes, mm -hmm. I agree. I mentioned uh, that in one of my most recent videos. Uh, it, in the uh, Clutches of Chaos. Yeah, in the Clutches of Chaos. I'm just like, this is going it, if to... It's, if, if it's even remotely as random as it seems just from the description, it's just like, <laughs> there'll yeah. be random things spawning, and then you'll get, you know, once you remove those things and put them on the act deck, then there'll be random sp clues spawning, and then you've got to go get those and put that. I'm just like, oh my god, this. Oh is man, if like, you can't if you can't remember to flip over Joe's hunch deck, uh, man, this scenario is going to be the most yeah, yeah. brutal oh, thing yeah. to try to play on camera. No yeah, kidding. it's it's hard enough to to keep track of. You know, this is like, did I did I draw a card for the uh, for the for this mythos phase? Much less. <laughs> Did, did I place a bunch of tokens on the table and did I move them around? And then of course, you know, they can trigger the, um, the incursions and then those incursions can trigger more tokens. And it's just like, Oh, and then pop, 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 pop. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I feel the same way. Like you could, like you could be at one side of the map and then everything could just happen on the other side and it'd be like, okay, now I, I've got to cart myself. Like that's one of the challenges of curtain call is if you get the wrong, you get one of the wrong draws, you'll have to crisscross that map a couple times, and and that's tough. Like if you don't have a lot of movement cards, it's tough to to make it from one side to the other, moving yeah. one location at a time. So, yeah. especially with the emissary. Yeah. Yeah. So. And who knows what how many enemies are going to be uh, be in that uh, clutches of chaos. Uh, deck so that's yeah. the only one that sort of i i when i read the description i was like uh oh yeah i felt i feel like they ffg even kind of knew about it as they didn't really <laughs> they didn't really say much about it and the article's real short so they were like yeah you guys can have fun with that <laughs> man's yeah. sitting in his evil evil you know rolling chair like ah. <laughs> yeah, um, I just hope there aren't too many tokens to keep track of because then it's, it's going to be one of those scenarios. I think that I, I hate I'd hate to get to the point where you play it and then you're like, okay, did I make a mistake? Did I get every token out where it should be? And then yeah. you're kind of like, oh, I might have missed one, and then oh. it sort of just feels like, oh, okay, like you I didn't spend be more time doing that than actually playing. Like yeah, like trying remember. trying to maintain yeah. game state. Yeah. yeah, you know, if you want to beat it cleanly, and then you're you're constantly having to double check and triple check tokens, it'd be just like, oh, this is yeah. gonna be tough. Yeah, yeah, Ugh. not looking forward to that, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, some other some other uh, mythos packs you know that have been announced kind of had certain feels to them and end up being completely different so who knows who knows yeah. how it'll end up i mean a, a lot of the other mythos packs in this cycle kind of feel like more of the same but maybe that's just kind of the way that they were announced you know like the 
Wages of Sin uh, announced all the haunted ability nonsense, and then another one kind of released the released the enemies in the in the Circle Undone expansion. So we've kind of I guess seen a lot of what's going to be happening. Yeah. So yeah, get... and then sort of see that you know there's going to be a lot of negative skill modifiers floating around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't think there's that many in the the core set itself, but I know that, or or at least in the the Circle Undone box. But you know, once you throw Whippoorwills in there, <sighs> again, and a Haunted ability, I think that does the same. Or same. yeah, there's a couple of Haunted yeah. abilities that do that, and then because of course there is, of course. And then there's going to be cards like Whispers in the Dark that you have to place near the agenda deck that are probably going to have, you know, I could see those having negatives. Uh, negative skill modifiers on them as well so yeah there, or, you, or you draw like three shapes in the mist and then you just you cry and yeah there's yeah. going to be a lot to keep track of and uh for someone who who tries to play correctly on stream that's going to be <laughs> that's going to be a pretty big challenge this time around yeah um i guess one thing we didn't talk about in this cycle though is the tarot cards in the new tarot slot what do you guys think about that um, I have mixed feelings about the tarot cards. I, I do like that they start in play if they're in your opening hand. Um, a plus one to that faction's typical um, preferred ability is great. Uh, the cost is a little high of, of three and not having any skill icons kind of turned me off from putting two in a deck. Um, so I played one copy in most of my decks and just hope for it to come out and if it doesn't it, i kind of just treat it as it's an extra bonus if i do happen to get it in my hand but it's not a card that i'm going to build anything around yeah, yeah I, I i tend to like them uh, i had a chance to play with uh, ace of swords and and i didn't draw it into my opening hand and so i had to play it the hard way and and i mean it the 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 problem with them is it's just a bonus you yeah. know, there's beside like if you don't draw them in your opening hand, it's just a it's just a plus one. So they're not the most interesting cards in the world, but but if you do luck out and draw one in your opening hand, then it's like, I'm not going to say no to playing with an extra uh, combat skill icon from right. the beginning. And I think the the neutral one, uh, Ace of Rods, is pretty cool. I, I do I did read the. Uh, the intro to the first scenario and i do like how you can actually get that right off the bat yeah uh, i think the weakness is brutal um yeah that, the weakness you, is absolutely brutal that is one of the so worst bad. weaknesses i've seen in a while and uh like it, it costs you a card in your opening hand it costs you resources to put it into play Four, it costs you an action to put it into play it's just like holy cow yeah it's like, brutal it hits you in in all of those points that you know action advantage and resources it just it just tags you in all of those and and uh i, I saw that you, you can draw it when you're engaged with an enemy or something and you need to commit cards to a skill test oh, first yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, I at this invocation event that i was at the one of the guys at the table he was playing a min deck and of course he drew the king in yellow um oh. right at the beginning of the game like it was like right off the bat and i just looked at him like oh crap and that is one of the worst weaknesses in the game and this thing replicates what it does mm -hmm. yeah like not a, yeah. not nearly as it's not as hard to get rid of but not being able to commit cards is is crippling and uh so yeah you throw that on top of you know okay it's cost you an action and a bunch of resources and an opening card slot and you've got a and you can't commit cards yeah that's, it's brutal that's I'm rough. Surprised. like it feels like the workings of a signature weakness yeah. seriously it's but, it's really bad yeah but then joe diamond just gets nothing for a weakness <laughs> but anyway anyway yeah I, actually I, I i found his weakness to be a little a little worse than i initially i initially figured it to be i'm not sure what it was about it though that i don't think i read it properly the first time i uh i looked at it it I think you got to drop a clue or something. Yeah, so you you place a clue place on. Place a clue, yeah. You place yeah, a clue that's on what, the location uh, with the highest shroud. 
I mean, it only costs two for him, but it's it's that uh, place a clue that was I was like, oh, that's uh, that's but not. But if great. you draw it and you don't have any clues, <coughs> you you still can play it without having to place a clue. Yeah. So there's times where it's not terribly bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the I don't certainly in uh, standalone, it's not a big deal because. Who cares about the experience? But, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the tower is definitely one of the. I see that you know you can get it in the. You can take the ace and the uh, the ace of rods and the tower. Uh, be interesting to see how that plays out over the course of the campaign. Um, you do get the two tablets. I think tablets are considered to be better than the uh, than the than the uh, elder things. Generally, so, but generally, generally, but yeah. I don't know. Just to avoid taking the tower, I might take the other things. Of course, for my for my playthrough, I'm going to take the tower. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're going to we're going to go all in on that. But we'll have to see how it goes. I mean, it it's it's so hard to tell at the beginning of of a of a cycle what's going to happen and. You know, I don't think anybody could have predicted at the beginning of, of the Forgotten Age which, uh, you know, which supplies were going to be important and which ones were not going to be important. And uh, I think that, you know, it's the same thing here. You're never, you're, it's, it's not going to become clear until uh, several more packs what the best, uh, what the best approach is. Um, is there anything that you guys don't like about the Circle Undone? I mean, for me, I think it's confusing that we have an investigator that is centered entirely around healing horror from other investigators, and there are no cards that heal horror in this entire set. <laughs> no, Blasphemy. That's my favorite investigator. It just... <laughs> that's just... I don't know. Maybe that's just, like, a horrendous oversight or what, but, like, that's just... That's just kind of strange to me. You no, know, it's you know I I approach her kind of like Diana. Like you can't see her as just a healer. It's common for a lot of people to just pack her full of healing cards or as many horror healing cards as they can, but you can't you can't play her that way. You know I think her deck building um, capabilities, her card pool, make her actually really strong. I I can see kind of what they were going for with her. Um, I, I don't disagree. It's just I, I just imagine you know we presented the scenario earlier where you're a new player and this is the oh, first yeah. deluxe expansion you pick up and you have this and clarity of mind. I think right. That's in first right. aid. So yeah, so it's I, more just keeping her in line with the rest of the investigators in the box. In terms of that, one hundred percent with you. A, a new player picking up the cycle and this being their first. Uh, expansion that they buy definitely it's it's going to kind of give them a a bad taste because this would be the second guardian that a new player would have if they have just this in the core set yeah uh yeah i mean I, I can see where you're coming from in terms of that yeah i hadn't thought about that uh i haven't played carolyn yet so it, it hadn't occurred to me that uh, she doesn't have any cards in the box that um really work with her that well i mean joe is he's got a bunch um, mm -hmm. preston obviously has a bunch and diana and rita but uh i mean yeah even marie to an extent too yeah so it's yeah. It, it, it just kind of seems like an oversight like just one card i i think would have been enough really because it's I like mean, you I... said you don't want to pack your deck full of you know effects that heal horror because yeah you're not winning the scenario if you're just healing horror so. Yeah, and, and I've seen decks on Arkham DB that are just that. Like, they just try to stuff as many healing, horror healing cards as they can, and they call that a deck. And the, unfortunately, they're going to have a, probably a really bad time playing that deck. Um, but you you learn, you know, doing that way. Um, I think I kind of agree with what you're saying in terms of the, the thing that I least liked about the cycle. It's not so much that I dislike it, but I think the investigators as a whole on, in this cycle are all complex and they kind of turn their turn their factions in over their heads because um, even Diana for a mystic uh, a new player is just not going to really be able to use her effectively um, Preston same thing you know with all ones for stats can be pretty confusing for a new player 
I think overall, just the, the investigators in the cycle, they're so complex that new players may not necessarily like any of them initially or be able to use them properly to where they have fun with them. Yeah, and I feel like that that problem is really just compounded if you're a new player and you just have this and the core set. Like, a lot of the... I feel like a lot of the investigators in this set are kind of... At least they feel designed with the implication that you own all of the player cards right. currently released, so... Yeah, I guess the out is that they can play Joe Diamond because if you can build a, a Roland deck, you can build a Joe Diamond. <laughs> that's, yep, yep, that's which true. Is basically what I did the first time I played it. Because <laughs> I just looked up a, a looked up a Roland deck and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much what I would do, and and I played mean, it played it out of Joe instead. I mean, obviously the you you're are, not um, wrong. I guess the uh, mm. the advancement is going to be different because because of the uh, you know they can't take the same leveled cards, but. Yeah, but Joe is essentially Roland in disguise, uh, different abilities. The I'm I'm actually kind of surprised by the number of high cost cards in the set, like the the numbers of like really expensive cards. There's a lot of threes. A lot of yeah. threes, like things There's like connect the dots right? and and uh, fingerprint kit fingerprint and. Kit. I I look at some of those and I I looked at a few decks online and I would never claim to be a very good deck builder i think it's probably the the weakest aspect of my game but then i see these decks that are just playing like they just pack their decks full of these expensive cars i'm just like i i don't know how you afford all of this stuff maybe maybe they'll release another card that uh similar to emergency cash that'll you know be maybe neutral for every faction to be able to take where you can get a little bit more resources or resources per round. Who knows? Maybe that's what they're planning. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it would have to be because, like, I, I think what Connect the Dots is four, Fingerprint Kit is four. Yep. Like, all the tarot cards are threes. Well, um, even Delay the, inev the Inevitable, it's two, but every round you're paying two, so it's really expensive, for a Guardian especially. Yeah, guard like, Interrogate... And I'm also kind of surprised that, like, with... I'm going to talk about this in my reviews a little bit, but with cards like Interrogate and Connect the Dots, they seem like they, they're they priced to f go in a in Joe Diamond's deck, in his Hunch deck. Mm -hmm. Like, Connect the Dots especially seems like they, they over-costed it intentionally because they know he's going to get the two resource discount on it. Um, but then... For those who don't have the card, Connect the Dots is a four-cost event, and it's a fast action. Uh, after you discover the last clue at your location, you discover two clues at a location with lower printed shroud value. And you mention Interrogate, that's a Guardian card at cost of two, and it's a parley action. And you can parley with a humanoid enemy at your location, test three combat, and it gets plus X difficulty, where X is the chosen enemy's damage value. If you succeed, you discover a clue at your location and one clue at any other location. Yeah. Like, those cards, like, they seem like they should go in the hunch deck, but then part of me is just like, well, they're also very timing sensitive. Like, I don't know if I'm going to draw a connect the dots when I'm going to discover the last clue at a location. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to have interrogate on the top of my hunch deck when there's a humanoid enemy at my location sort of thing. And so part of me is just like, wants to put them in the hunch deck and the other part of me is just like well they don't i'd like a little bit more flexibility you know keeping them out of the hunch deck so okay now i know i i can play i can play those cards this turn because i'm i'm fulfilling those uh those conditions they have yeah i hope that doesn't become a problem with seeker and insight cards in general going forward is that they kind of have to be designed in such a way that oh well if we, you know, cost them too low, then Joe can just play them for free. So I, I hope that doesn't happen, but I I trust Matt Newman's judgment on that on that front. So Yeah, we'll see. I, I think I think they have to put another card that, that grants a little bit more in terms of resources. Um, I was just thinking about a new Guardian card they announced. Um, actually it's I think it's coming out in the next Mythos pack, right? In the Wages of Sin, the um 
the Tommy gun, uh, Tom forty five Thompson. Yeah, it's in uh, the secret name. Oh, secret name. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, six uh, resources. Six resources for a guardian. That's. that's yeah, I think impossible. I think the bigger test is going to come when the secret name drops this week. Um, those gold cards are going to shake things up, and Ooh. <laughs> and I think, yeah, that's going to be a, a that's going to be a really interesting uh, pack because uh, that's that's something new for the game, and I think he may uh, they may be tend to be underpowered uh, rather than overpowered. Just you know, as a first, you know, the designers are dipping their toes in the water here to see see what they can do, and they don't really want to make too many waves but yeah i mean that that machine gun i mean it costs six that's that's a lot of uh change in a guardian deck and it takes up two hand slots which yeah. makes it uh you know for a solo player like myself that's not going to work <laughs> yeah i guess i could play bandolier but Ooh. maybe level two bandolier <laughs> <laughs> I like level two bandolier for skids. Uh, skids with a Tommy gun and a level two bandolier and police badge. Pretty good. Then I could see, yeah, I could see that being pretty good. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I'm playing Leo Anderson in contraband level two, so I'm not really one to talk. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. But so, I think I think there's an you know when the people tend to look at these powerful cards, but they they sort of neglect to look at the cost as closely and mm-hmm. and. I'm not sure whether that's the right. Like I know I was just reading the Reddit thread about the the machine gun and and some people did point it out. I mean, it's six resources. I mean, for rogues that's that's not a not as big a deal, but for a guardian who has a bunch of stuff to afford. You know, it's the same with mystics. They have there's just so much stuff they've got to buy and they you know, unless you're playing somebody like David Renfield to get those extra resources or and you get them in your opening hand you know you only start with five yeah and that doesn't go very far and then i you know we see in um chaos and whatever you know the agency backup that costs seven man they they have to do something with with the resources i mean seven sure. resources that's that's a full turn if you draw it yep. in your opening hand take two resources and play that thing leo doesn't get a discount on it i mean really, really your only option is to to try to uh calling in favors it out but even then you're only going to get maybe two two three resources depending on on which allies you've got in your deck yeah three or maybe four if you're playing maybe top or something but yeah yeah so it's that's yeah. good. seven I, is a I I'd saw be, seven and I boy oh boy yeah I'd be I mean it's a powerful if, card it's an amazing card oh yeah it's like I'd they be, just took every guardian ally and rolled them into one <laughs> one ally here you go here's a here's a mega guardian ally that does everything every other guardian ally does and plus it makes you a ham sandwich show. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can have two of them if you've uh, got charisma oh my goodness don't even. <laughs> Oh man, that's the forty nine experience deck right there. Yeah, double charisma, <laughs> double agency yeah, backup. I, you know, I don't think. I mean, maybe Leo can play it. it I, yeah, even still, like you're still like probably playing a, an emergency cash just to get it out. So yeah, you really. You I can mean, also just, use chance encounter, but then somebody else or flare, but then somebody else ends up with your ally, and I'm not sure that's. That's yeah. what people would want. I'd be interested like, I'll just see... take your ally from you. That's just like, thanks a lot. Thanks. I'd be interested to see if they make um, class-specific resource-gaining cards. So maybe something like, um, I don't know, like test, maybe like something like Liquid Courage, where it's like gain, gain a resource and then test whatever the class relevance um, you know, skill is. By a certain mm. number and then gain an extra resource and whatever yeah we did see like during the forgotten age we saw things like um what's that the the one in the uh the survivor one i'm thinking of take heart oh, yeah. stuff like that there was like a um there's also the i'm uh, missing names here i'm just looking at the list to see if i can 
pick them out here quickly. Um, what was the uh, like payday for the for rogues? Oh yeah, right. And yeah. stuff like that. So they did have that sort of that sort of theme running through. Yeah, Guardians have some resource uh, generation at, at higher levels, but they're so expensive. Like uh, I've had worse. You take damage and you gain resources equal to the amount of damage you cancel, or you cancel damage, and you gain resources equal to the amount of damage you canceled up to five. Uh, you got stand together and ever vigilant. Kind of is like a resource gain. Yeah, but I feel like even with those cards, first they take experience to take and. They're just not enough. Our guardians yeah. are so asset de dependent. I mean, Mystic's got, um, oh, what's that card that reduces their spell cost by three uh, to play one spell card? Dark ritual. Oh. No, so, it's, no, it's, it's the, so, uh, uh, something ritual. Uncontrolled. Yeah, I'm talking about a magic card apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's even with that card in their decks, Mystics still have a big problem trying to get you know their assets out. They're just and guardian assets are just getting more and more expensive. Yeah, I think guardians have that problem, but worse because they don't have a card like that at all. So right. Yeah. So uncage the soul. That's uncage the, the soul. Yeah. Man, we were all wrong. We were yeah. way off. We were way off. I figure I should know these cards by the back of my hand by now, but <laughs> it just shows my age. I'm starting to have short-term memory loss here. I think it happens to all of us. I think it does too. <laughs> I do. I, it just goes to show if I I would make a terrible Magic player because they have like ten times as many cards to keep track oh, of. Oh, ten! I think they have thousands. Their card pulls over ten. I, well, I'm just talking in one cycle. I've got. <laughs> oh yeah. It's yeah, been yeah. a long time since I played Magic, and they've I don't know they've re released ten thousand cards since then. So. I think they're almost up to twenty thousand actually. That's insane. I stopped playing a few years ago, like back in 2014, 2015, and they were already at like 19,000 unique cards, so. Yeah, so I have to I have to try to remember 10 new ones a month. And... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, to be oh. fair, you only play with like a couple of them at a time, so. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so with... With the mythos phase wrapped up, I guess we'll go into the investigation phase. Um, this is the part of the show where we kind of wrap things up and talk about other um, non-Arkham, but still mythos-related things. So uh, why, don't, why don't you guys talk about what you guys have been recently doing? Oh, um, I got two things. I got, um, I've got. i been reading a, uh, a it's, I guess, a comic book, or they call them graphic novels, uh, called Weird Detective. It's pretty interesting. It's deals with Yithians. It's all Lovecraft. It's from Dark Horse Comics, and it's fantastic. Uh, the story is really good. The art is really good. There's a lot of humor in it, like dark humor. It's it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect for some for fans of Lovecraft and Lovecraftian things. Uh, so I highly recommend that you guys check it out if you're into graphic novels. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is an Arkham Horror related thing, and it is a uh, community creation. It's uh, a deck I, I actually spotlighted this week in my channel, and or not a deck, but a uh, an investigator. It's a custom investigator named Vanessa Conblanco, created by Mr. Wolf, and she is a really interesting uh, survivor with a thirteen. She has thirteen um, cards that go in her deck. She can only build a deck of twenty cards because thirteen cards are hers and. They kind of tell the story about her past and, and a lover that she killed to make a dark pact. It's a it's a really, really interesting investigator with some fantastic art. And if you like custom content for Arkham Horror, the card game, I highly recommend you check her out as well. Where can you find it? Uh, she On my channel, I posted a review video for it. Um, Mr. Wolf posted her on Board Game Geek, and the link is on my channel. Um, but I'm, the URL is one of those like really complex URLs, so I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll just link um, it on my. I'll have all the URLs and stuff that we mentioned uh, in the show notes for any of our listeners. So. Perfect. Well, then there, that's where you can find it in the show notes. Boom. Uh, Cameron, what about you? What have you? I know you. I I just but... like to give a shout out to uh, to Horror Babble on uh, YouTube. They uh, they do readings of. Uh, all sorts of 
horror related uh, material and they have i think most if not all of uh lovecraft stories up as well as uh they do yep as uh lovecraft adjacent writers um and uh, so if you have time just uh, and you and you just want to you don't have time to actually read a book um like i do sometimes i just put it on at work and i can listen to listen to the stories it's a great way to 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 catch up on the writing as well as uh just see where some of the the cards were inspired from i know that i listened to the uh, the mound shortly after uh the forgotten age was uh, released and so it was it was really interesting to see how some of those ideas were translated into cards in the uh, in uh, during the cycle. I know I chose the pickaxe uh, as one of my supplies just because it was one of the main tools used in <laughs> yep. the mound story. And I figured if it was important in the mound, it's got to be important in uh, during this cycle. And uh, also, if you haven't listened to uh, just the Call of Cthulhu, uh, Wayne June's reading of it, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. I yes. could listen to that thing over and over again. It's uh, he's got an an amazing voice and and does a a great job of of telling that story. And uh, yeah, there's actually I mean, the guy hits Cthulhu with a boat. Like, <laughs> how cool is that? It's just like he just runs into Cthulhu with a boat. He That's, does. It's awesome. Horror Babel is awesome, and they not only do they have each story individually read out on a YouTube video, but um, the owner of that channel has also compiled all of them together in a huge 22-hour-long video. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So oh, if you're curious goodness. to read every single Cthulhu Mythos story, <laughs> it is on there. So In one sitting. Definitely go check out Horror Babel. They're great. Um yeah, it's, it's there's there's a lot of the stuff like I had read most of Lovecraft's main stories when I was in my twenties, but uh, a lot of the stuff that he wrote with co-authors or under different names and and stuff like that I hadn't read, and so it was great to catch up on some of those those stories that I missed uh, because they you know the for, I mean people who are familiar with the mythos know it's not really a a concrete thing there's you know lots of little bits and pieces that have been uh added over the years by by many different people and so it's uh it's a good way to to see where some of those um those uh elements came from and they also have the the carcosa stuff up there as well which is a which is great if you're just playing the path to carcosa for the first time to uh to listen to those stories yeah for those unaware those are the robert w chambers uh short uh collections of uh short stories named uh named the king in yellow so those are also available on horror babble's youtube channel um but it's funny that you speak of uh the wayne um wayne's reading of the call of cthulhu because there's actually a really cool um animated version of that same reading on youtube as well that you can find that i'll link in the show notes it's about a little over half an hour long but it's really cool and there's another um i found a russian youtube channel where the guy takes um lovecraft stories and he does animated kind of graphic novel style movies to them that are really cool that i'll also link um wow i feel like i've been missing out on all these youtube channels (laughs) I haven't heard of any of them. That sounds awesome. I can't wait to check these out. Yeah, so definitely check those out. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off in the middle of what no, you were saying, Cameron. But no, the yeah, there was a there was one story. I can't remember the the gate through the silver key or something like that. Man, that was uh, when I I hadn't read that one before, and so when I uh, got a chance to listen to that, that was uh, that was a, a great one. I would. Uh, love to see a campaign based around something like that although we've already sort of had it with the yithians so uh there's always I, more room for yithians though yeah well we need to use that in that yithian investigator card in more scenarios now <laughs> yeah absolutely wouldn't that be fun but can they build decks i don't remember no they can't build <laughs> no. decks um, which is a shame they should release some sort of some sort of uh deck that you could build for it 
That'd that be would funny. be cool. Just a, maybe one of those uh, designer diaries they do on FFG site. Matt can sit down and construct a Yithian deck. That'd be that, awesome. <laughs> that you could play through a through a scenario through scenarios if you wanted to. All right, Matt Newman, if you're listening, you got three weeks roughly until April first, so get on that. That would be hilarious to read. Um, yes, please, please, please do that. Um, one thing I want to mention is I've been recently reading through the Fall of Delta Green RPG, which is awesome. Um, if you're fans of the outer surrounding um, creative works of the Mythos, um, the Fall of Delta Green takes place in the 1960s, and Delta Green is a um, co- covert uh, part of the U.S. government that battles and confronts the Mythos. So in the game, you're tasked as being an agent, and it's, yeah, it's awesome. Um, they explain things like how the Roswell Isn't is actually a front for the Migos to abduct and steal people, and what they call the Greys, or the, the aliens, are actually, like, constructs of the Migo, and they abduct people for experiments and take their brains, and that's why their brains are so big. Um... And they go into things like various cults, um, like a cult of secret Nazis that uses weird science in combination with Cthulhu rituals. So there's some really cool stuff to check out, even if you're not a fan of playing RPGs or don't have the time, but are a fan of the mythos, it's pretty cool to check out. Yeah, I've, I used to play the Call of Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu quite a bit and, and loved, uh, I loved what you what you can use the mythos for to graft on to to sort of everyday events to turn mm-hmm. them into to very sinister events without yeah. too much trouble. Is this a fairly new game? This uh, Fall of Delta Green. Um, so the original Kickstarter was um, started in 2015, but the physical books actually weren't printed until July of last year. So. Oh, okay. So it's fairly new. It's fairly it, recent. There... Are there printed modules for it, or is it something that kind of the community just creates for it? Or um, There are a couple printed scenarios. Um, there's one that's included in the actual book itself, but um, I believe they are planning on releasing a collection of um, operations that you can, that you can purchase. Uh, you can also alternatively just adapt anything from the original Delta Green game. So for those unaware, um, The Fall of Delta Green and Delta Green are two different games. Um, The Delta Green is set with the Call of Cthulhu rules, and The Fall of Delta Green is set with the Gumshoe rules. Um, So they they have slight uh, differences in how they play, but uh, overall they're essentially the same thing. And in the back of The Fall of Delta Green book, there's a conversion kit that allows you to easily just convert them so so if you're apt to just converting your already published scenarios from other games you can easily just plop them into your 1960s setting mm-hmm. um, yeah I thought it might be fun to do like a, a version of the haunting where instead of going through like an abandoned an abandoned estate you're going through like an abandoned drug house <laughs> you're like you know finding crazy people on acid like worshiping haster that'd be kind of neat but yeah so that's been pretty much what i've been doing i've been busy with a lot of personal life stuff lately but i'm gonna be actually getting married in a couple months so I'll be... oh congratulations Thanks. congratulations um yeah so i'll actually be planning on doing a bit of a meetup um uh, for any of our German listeners, I'll be in Germany for a couple of weeks at the end of May. So, uh, hit me up if you want to meet up, and maybe we can play some Arkham in Germany. Um, one thing before we sign off, I do have an extra copy of the Circle Undone. So, if you're interested in winning a copy of that, um, the three of us will think of something and we'll figure out a way to give that to you guys. So, stay tuned for that as well. Um, I believe there was some other some other things for next for next episode. Yes. Yeah, so for our upkeep phase, um, our website, uh, our URL, what is our URL for our website? It is the greatoldonesgaming.com. 
Perfect. Uh, and we do have a fourth member for the podcast, and it is Nathan Early. He runs probably what is the biggest uh, gaming store in North America, Guardian Games. It's a pretty awesome store. Anyways, he uh, he is at Arkham in Flames right now as we are recording this. So he will be back in the next episode and talk about his experiences there. Yeah, looking forward to hearing. That's that's the one put on by the Drawn to the Flame, Drawn to the Flame gang, I believe. Yes. Yep. It is takes it? place in England, and it is a, a mini convention where players, Arkham Horror LCD players, get together and just play Arkham Horror, and um, it goes through the weekend. I think it's three or maybe four days long. Oh, wow. so yes, I believe so. I believe it's that yeah. Friday through Sunday. And this is the first one that they've put together, so it's a brand new thing. Yeah, that's amazing. We're pretty. If spoiled. I organized a convention here, there'd be me. <laughs> and maybe my maybe if I could persuade my boys to play, there'd be three of us. There you go. We could turn it into a three day event, I guess. Just just but, play uh, through each major campaign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, kudos to the to the drawn to the flame guys for putting that together. That's a that's a massive amount of work. Oh yeah, absolutely. Those guys kill it over there in general. I mean, they yeah. pump out content like no man's business. I don't know what Frank and Peter are doing, but kudos, yeah, man. They're, they're so involved with the community. They're just they're just awesome guys. Yeah. So if you do, if you don't already listen to them, you should. So. Um, but yeah, th- does anyone else have anything to say before we sign off here? Uh, no, just looking forward to the release of The Secret Name. Um, coming up, I think it's Thursday. Uh, I'm hoping to get my copy the week after that. And uh, it looks like my schedule is going to be a little freer after once that drops. So uh, hopefully I can uh, pump out some playthroughs. Nice, and, nice. Uh, and catch up. I feel like I've uh, fallen behind a little bit, but... Uh, that's the thing with these games is that when they're on a monthly release schedule, it doesn't take much to, uh, to yeah. uh, fall behind. And um, we got like four products pretty much like back to back to back to back to back. So Yeah, there was a period there where we it, it felt like every week something new was coming out. I know. Yeah. It, yeah. it was. was it was there literally was, like every week. There was Guardians of the Abyss, then Return to the Dunwich Legacy, then The Circle Undone, and, and now the uh, the Secret Name. Yeah, I mean, even, so. like, Shattered Aeons was, like, the month before that, too. So it was, like, Shattered yeah. Aeons, Guardians, into Return to Dunwich, into uh, Circle and Dun. Yeah, it was just, like, boom, ba boom ba boom ba boom And then they were also releasing all the teaser articles for all the Mythos packs in the Circle and Dun, too. So it was just, like, there was a lot to keep up with over the past couple of months. Yeah, well, I think we should be grateful for it now because I know, I mean, if you look what's the uh, release schedule for the Lord of the Rings LCG, that has definitely slowed down over the past uh past couple years yeah and it's uh i don't know if they're getting mythos packs monthly anymore or whether it's or i keep calling the mythos packs um adventure packs whether they're getting them uh they're getting them monthly or not but uh it seems like they have to wait a a long time these days so uh, hopefully we never get to that uh that point yeah Yeah, so too Thankfully, um, you know, the Lovecraftian mythos lends itself to a lot of open-ended, um, you know, story ends, so you can really kind of go anywhere with it. Yeah, there's a ton of content, for sure. So, but, um, yeah, so thank you all for listening. It's already been almost two hours. Um, I'm Nate, lost in time and space. Uh, with me are my two co-hosts. Innkeeper Vase Odin from the Twisted Tentacle Inn. And I'm uh, Cameron, better known as Man from Lang from the uh, Whisper in the Dark Whisper in Darkness YouTube channel. Alrighty, thank you very much for listening. Until next time when the stars align, we'll see you next time. Thank you guys.